Good morning. I'm glad to see each of you here this morning. My hope and prayer is that these pews will continue to fill up. I see more and more faces every week, and that is a good thing. I'm thankful for that, and uh, hope and pray that we can continue to move in that direction so that we will be able to all be back together again, assembling. I'm so thankful for your presence and also for those especially that are uh, tuning in online that are unable to be here. We hope that you'll have an opportunity to be back in person in the future. The title of the lesson is, How Can Jesus Relate to Me? That is, how can Jesus, the silver-spooned Savior, relate to me? And some people may say, well, wait a minute, I don't like that. Well, I don't like it either, but that's the title of the lesson, and there's a reason for it, because there's some people that view God as so far away, so distant, that there's no way the Godhead or any part of it can relate to them and what they're facing on a daily basis here on earth. There's no way that any part of the Godhead, whether it be God the Father, the Son, the Spirit, any part of the Godhead can relate to us and know what it's like to live here and to suffer and to feel pain and to go through agony and to know what life is really all about. There's no way. And so that's the idea that's often presented especially at least some in the world that are just living their life and they don't really know God and they don't really know that much about God or especially the Son, Jesus Christ, and that's how they view Jesus. How can He know anything about me? How can He even begin to relate to me? He is far above, and I'm down here on earth having to make it one day at a time. At least that's the idea that's often presented Some people, because of that belief, they believe that God does not care about them. He cannot understand what they are going through. And so he could never really relate to anybody here on this earth. At least that is the mindset that is presented. But we know better because we've had an opportunity to get to know what we would call Jesus What we mean by that is we know the Godhead because of what the Godhead has revealed to us through His Word. And so when we read and study, we come to understand the Godhead. We come to understand Jesus Christ. And because we have that knowledge that has been revealed through the Holy Spirit by God Himself to us through the Word, because we have that knowledge then we see Jesus very differently than maybe those that do not have that information. Those that have never taken the time to study the Bible, that do not know really what Jesus' life was about, that have only heard about but never really understood from the text of the Bible what His life was like, maybe they have a misconstrued idea of what Jesus' life was really like. And if only they would take the time to open up the pages of the Bible, if only they would take the time to study the life of the Savior Jesus Christ, then they would find out that, you know what? God does care. That Jesus, He can relate to me. You see, He chose to involve Himself in our struggles. To understand the human fleshly life. That God didn't just stand back and say, see, I know what my creation has done and walk away. He did not do that. But he showed great care in realizing that there was a problem and trying to move forward toward a solution. He did so through his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, he gave himself up from the glories of heaven to come down here and to live life, to be made a little lower than the angels, the Bible says, to suffer so that he would know what it was like and ultimately to pay the price so that we could have eternal redemption as the perfect sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Now Hebrews presents a picture of this priest, this great high priest that we have as being a high priest that can understand what it's like to live here on this earth. And because of that, he can serve in that capacity for us. Now, the Bible calls Jesus the great advocate. 
In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, it talks about the fact that we certainly shouldn't be sinning, but if we do, we have what? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he is one that understands what it's like to be here, and he can relay that then to the heavenly Father. He pleads on our behalf as our advocate. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but as was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. What does that mean? He knows what it's like to be here. And to live on this earth. He knows what it's like to have Satan tempt him to choose to do wrong, to sin. He has been involved in this life. He's been touched with the feelings of the same things that we go through. Though it may not be the exact same thing that we face, he's been there and he's felt those feelings. And because of that, we have an opportunity to come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, find grace in time of need because we have a great high priest, because we have Jesus Christ that stands there as a mediator between God and man. There's only one, and it is Jesus Christ. And because we have such an amazing, a great mediator, that should provide us great comfort. And now the question is, how can then Jesus relate to me? There are some, some that unfortunately have gotten the wrong idea of what that life was like that Jesus lived. So what we want to do is we want to provide that information to set that record straight. And for those that have the idea that God is so far removed from me, He can't understand me or He can't relate to me, we want to fix that. We want to provide that information so that they can understand that God does care and that Jesus, the Savior, can relate to us and what we are going through. You know, if I was going to have to go to court and I wanted somebody to represent me and I was going to have to file a workers' comp claim because I was injured at work at no fault of my own because my employer had done something that was completely incompetent had done something they should not have ever done, which caused me to suffer tremendous harm and change my life forever so that I couldn't work. You know what I would want to do? I'd want to get me a good attorney, wouldn't you? I'd want a good attorney, but I would want one that knows what it's like to be on the other side of that and somebody that has really worked. I wouldn't want somebody that really didn't care about my case or didn't care about me or my life or could care less. I was just one case in a pile of cases that were very low on the totem pole. No, no, no. I would want to find somebody that really cared and that wanted to win and that was invested in it. In the same way, when we look at Jesus Christ, we're looking to an advocate, an advocate we would call an attorney a lot of times in our situation here on earth. And Jesus Christ is our advocate. So the question is, can he relate to us? Is he invested in our life? That's the question we want to answer. Number one, Jesus has wept. You know, we read through that verse and we say, oh, it's, a, it's just a short verse. One of the shortest in the Bible, depending if you're taking it from the Greek or the English. And so we know that verse, and if we ask kids to memorize a verse, and we don't tell them which one, and they come back and they've memorized a verse, they're going to regurgitate it. Often it's John 11, 35. You know, Jesus wept. Why? It's so short. It's easy, right? We just glance over it so fast. But if we pause for a moment, we then begin to ask ourselves, when's the last time that you really, you personally, shed tears like this. Now, it, it hurts personally. If I personally am going to sit and think about that, it takes me to a dark place. It doesn't take me to a good place. It takes me to a, plain, a place of hurt when I think about that. But when I try to look at Jesus and his life, I begin to realize, now, wait a minute. He's been there too. He knows what it's like. 
for him to have wept in his life, then something bad had to have happened. And he had to have been taken to a place of great sadness and sorrow for him to feel that. You know, often we think that there's no way he can relate. No, he can. Because he has been there. He was weary. We think of Jesus being this superhero often in our minds. But we have the Godhead. The Word was made flesh. John chapter 1 and verse 14. Dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten full of grace and truth. But He was made flesh. And so He went through life. Have you ever been a time where you are just dog tired? When I say dog tired, you know, sometimes they show pictures of dogs and they just fall asleep in awful positions and they're just out, completely out. They may be sitting up and their head's leaning on the side of the couch and they're, they're done, tongues hanging out. Dog tired, that's what we mean when we say that. You ever been tired? Oh, I know I have. And sometimes it feels like every day I feel like that and it just keeps on going and on going. I'm thinking, when is this ever going to ease up and end? And we realize, now wait a minute, our Savior lived on this earth, he was in the flesh, and he has been in that same state. He's been to the point where he is absolutely tired and exhausted, and of course John 4, 6 gives a picture of him being wearied on his journey. We also know that when he was trying to bear the cross, how difficult it would have been, having been scourged and beaten and spit upon and abused, to then say, now you have to take this load upon you. It would have been heavy for any person to have to bear, but especially someone that was already exhausted from an overnight sham of a trial with no sleep, and then to have to go through all that he went through and to be beaten and then say, now you have to carry this heavy cross. He asks you a question, has he ever been weary? Has he ever been tired? Yes, he has. What about hungry or thirsty? You know, my kids used to say, oh, I'm starving, I'm starving. I told them, don't do that. When we moved overseas and I saw real children starving, I told them to take that out of their vocabulary. And every now and then, I'll catch myself maybe saying something like that, and I have to stop myself and realize, now, wait a minute, I really am not starving. That's very clear. You know, my gut's hanging over my, 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 my britches, and, and I'm having to go up in sizes. no. Definitely not. Anybody can look at my face and see these chubby cheeks and say, that man's not starving. You know, but Jesus, he was at a point where he absolutely was hungry. And you think about when he was there in Luke chapter 4 and verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. Now that's impressive. Now, if I have gone a day without eating anything, I can feel it. Can you? Have you ever, you know, fasted? You've gone through a period of fasting and you realize you, you can feel it. You start getting weak, you kind of get shaky, get tired, and everything kind of gets off. Forty days he didn't eat. And when they were ended afterward, he hungered, the Bible says in Luke chapter 4 and verse 2. He's been there. He's been hungry. When he was hanging upon that cross in John chapter 19 and verse 28, and you imagine the long time, I mean, because for sure they haven't given him anything. I mean, having been arrested there in the garden, and then he was taken through all night this trial, going here and there and here and there, and then finally to have been beaten and scourged, and he's faced all of this and mocked and... He's taken that cross up to that hill of Golgotha and there he's nailed onto that cross and hoisted up and he's hanging there. And it's been a while since he's had anything. I can assure you he was thirsty. And it says here in John chapter 19 and verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And I'm sure. You say, why well, can he relate with it? Well, he, you know, maybe he can relate to a few things. He was poor. Some people use the term silver spoon. That just means he's come from a place of maybe wealth or prominence or position or some affluence. But when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, when he came here, he didn't come that way. Well, he was 
born in a manger. I mean, that's not coming into the earth in a, a form of great prominence, but actually it's coming into this earth in a place of poverty. A matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Now, what does that mean? Well, he was in heaven. <laughs> you know, He left the royalty of heaven to come down and as the word be made flesh. He became poor that ye through his poverty might be made rich. He left the glories and the mansions above to come here for you and for me. And when you look at the life that he lived, you realize it was not a life that we would call somebody that has had a silver spoon, everything handed to them and never had hardship in their life. That is not the life of the Savior that we serve. He became homeless, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20 says, And Jesus saith unto them, The foxes, what do they have? Well, they have holes. What about the birds, the birds of the air? What do they have? They have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So, you think about all those animals and yet look at his life and how hard that must have been. Especially when he look at, you look at his earthly ministry and everybody else, they're, 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 they've got their household and they've got their home and they're building this, this nest where everything starts to collect. And yet you look at the life of Jesus Christ and he was going around and he was looking at the needs of others. He wasn't caring about what he could uh, uh, accumulate or gather together or stockpile. What he was looking at is how can I save the lost? How can I look out for the needs of others? And as he was going here and there, he didn't even have a place, as we would call, to lay his head. When we look at his life, it was not always easy. He, had, he did face hardship, and we already noticed that he wept. And the reason is because he had a friend. And someone that was close to him, and that friend passed away in John chapter 11, verse 14. It tells us why Jesus wept. Because Lazarus had died. And because of that close relationship and that close bond, it tells me that my Savior understands that when I have somebody in my life that I'm close to, and then they perish, He knows what that is like. And so when he serves as my advocate and he pleads as my go-between to serve between me and God, he understands and he cares. He had family problems, as we can see in John chapter 7 and verse 5. We all, it may be in different points in our life, in different areas of our life, maybe we've had family issues or family problems and had to struggle through those. They're not easy. But he had to go through that as well. The Bible says, neither did his brethren believe in him. And I assure you that when he was going around and saying and making these claims and they said, we don't believe, that caused some family problems. I'm telling you, it did. That was not easy to have those that were supposed to be there with him and close to him to turn away from him and say, we're not going to have any part in this. Now, later on, they changed their minds because then they knew for sure he was the Christ, the Son of God. But during his earthly ministry, they didn't believe. And they rejected him. His close friends betrayed him. And when you look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 25, you find out that here is Judas. And Judas was even chosen there of Christ, but he betrayed him. And, and when you read through the Psalms, you realize that David and the other psalmists, a lot of times when they're writing, they're writing about people that have turned against them. Maybe enemies, and often in the psalms, you find that there's somebody that was really close to them, but then turned on them, and turned around and was stabbing them in the back and trying to hurt them and harm them. And David had to deal with that with Saul. As Saul was chasing him around, and he was having to run and hide in caves, and he had to live that kind of life. He knew what it was like, and when he writes the psalms, you can see that. You can really see what it was like to, to step into his shoes and to have somebody that was close to just turn on you. 
But maybe you've had to live that. Maybe you've had those that were close to you to turn around and stab you in the back and harm you. But then again, our Savior understands because He had Judas to betray Him. How hard it would have been during that Last Supper to be there and sit across that table and to know and to realize that that one person was going to betray you To know later on in that garden he was going to kiss you and identify you and lead those captors to come and to take you away to be crucified. How hard that must have been. But he has been there. He's been misunderstood. I've been misunderstood. I know you have in your life. Mark 9.32, they understood him not. Even in John 8.27, they didn't understand him and... No matter how hard sometimes he would try to communicate so clearly and still, they didn't understand him. Evil people in his life mistreated him. And honestly, when you look at the verses that are referenced in Matthew 27, 36, it talks about people watching him. And when you read in Luke 6, 7, they were watching him because they they wanted to see if they could find some fault. They wanted to find some accusation. And so they were constantly looking to see if they could nitpick or find something so that they could try to turn him in and find that fault. How hard that would have been to have to go through life constantly knowing that somebody is looking at your life and trying to find some fault so they can destroy you. How hard that would have been, and yet Jesus has been there. You also notice that he was despised, he was rejected, according to Isaiah 53 and verse 3. Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not, according to John chapter 1 and verse 10. Think about that for a minute. He came to his own. And those Jews that were supposed to be so tight-knit and interwoven and so close rejected him. How hard would that have been to live through? And yet he did. Matter of fact, in Matthew 26 and verse 67, they spit in his face. They buffeted him. They beat upon him. Others smote him with the palms of their hands. In Matthew 27 and verse 39, they reviled him. They made fun of him. They walked by taunting him. The Bible says, wagging their heads. Making fun of him. He say, you know, he, he saved others. He, he can't save himself. Look at him. He's up there. They made fun of him when he was on that cross. They called him a deceiver in Matthew 27 and verse 63. He was despised. Not just like they, they well, casually didn't like him. They literally despised him. You can tell when you're around other people that maybe have that type of feeling towards you, you know. And all, most of the time when somebody has that type of feeling towards you, they don't hold it in. They're just going to let you know. And they have no problem telling you to your face that they really don't like you and they wish that you were dead. Have you ever had anybody that was just that much of an enemy to you that they would treat you so awful in such a way? Well, Jesus was there. Believe it or not, he was arrested. You know, we come in contact with people and we say, well, they've been arrested. Well, yeah, so was Jesus. Now, falsely so, but he was arrested. He had been in bonds, the Bible says. In John chapter 18, in verse 12, they came and they bound him. We would say they they slapped the handcuffs on him and led him away. He had been arrested. And he had been there. He was lied about. He was wrongfully condemned. It's sad to say. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. Maybe you have, and maybe this would relate to you where somebody has made some accusation against you to harm your reputation, to harm your character, and it was just false. It was fabricated. The Bible calls that false witness, and and the Bible says in Matthew 26 and verse 60 that there were many false witnesses that came, and specifically as it continues on, it talks about two false witnesses. They came and just fabricated false evidence just so that they could crucify Jesus. Just so that they could punish Him and put Him through misery. Maybe that can relate some way to you. And Maybe in your life you've gone through something like that. Where people have set out just to hurt you and harm you. When you look at Luke 23 
And you look at the context there, looking in verse 18, when they were there, they didn't want to have any part. That crowd cried away with this man, release the other guy. We want the criminal. We don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas. We want that criminal over there. And later on, over and over, when you read this, and Pilate's trying to do everything he can to say, now look, I've not found any fault in this man. Let's release somebody else. And they tried to get, he tried to give the crowd every opportunity. And over and over in Luke 23, you read this. He tried, he tried. And the angry mob screamed out, crucify him, crucify him, verse 21. In verse 23, again, they were instant. Screaming at the top of their lungs is how we would express it. It says they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and the chief priest prevailed. He was wrongly condemned. He was physically assaulted. He endured such hardship. It's hard to even fathom now, I've, you know, I, maybe you've had people spit in your face. I know that in, 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 in the past that that's even happened to me. It's no fun, is it? I mean, when somebody's really that angry and just, it just is, it's insulting at the, the highest level, at least to, I think so. Um, and maybe you've, you've been there and you know, and, and, and maybe you, you've had somebody beat up on you and, and physically assault you. Maybe you've had somebody then take up the hand and just whack you. I don't know, but... Does that feel good? Is that something that you just want to happen to you today when you're walking into Walmart and somebody doesn't like you or doesn't like what you're wearing or doesn't like something that you've said or you've just come out of worship and, oh, you're a Christian and spits in your face? I mean, how's that going to make you feel? I mean, how would you receive that? Uh, huh. Not very good. And later on when you reflect about it, you think about how hard that would have been for our Savior to go through something like that. And yet without sin, he died. How can he relate? He lived from beginning to end here on this earth. He was born here in the flesh as the incarnate Word. And he perished in the flesh, though the Word never died, is eternal. And so that fleshly body of the Savior was put into that tomb and then resurrected. You see in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. We see Jesus. If somebody says, well, how can, how can God relate to me? How can Jesus relate to me? He can if you know the Jesus that you read about in the Bible, Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior, the Son of God. If you really know Him, you're going to know just how much He can relate to you. How much He can mean to you as an advocate, as a mediator. 1 Thessalonians 5.10 says, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Can Jesus relate to me? Can He relate to you? I, I hope that as we've studied this lesson, that maybe you appreciate your mediator even more. That maybe you walk away today thinking, Man, what a Savior. What an advocate that we have with the Father. Maybe your appreciation will be just so much more to know that we have such a wonderful Savior. If you've not given your life to Christ, to the Savior, to the Son of God, will you not today believe that He is the chosen one of God, the Son of God? And based upon believing that, be willing to turn your life upside down, to turn away from sin, to serve Jesus Christ in repentance. Be willing then to confess with your lips, yes, He is. He's the Son of God, the resurrected Messiah. And be willing to submit to baptism so that your sins can be washed away, so that you can rise to walk as a new creature in Jesus Christ, all of your past forgiven. That's what Jesus has done for us. He died on the cross so that you can live for Him. What will you do with that? 
Maybe you've been unfaithful. You've turned away from Him in your life and you're already a Christian, but you've just you've turned away. You haven't been living faithfully. Remember, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 tells us now we, we shouldn't be sinning, but if we find ourselves in that situation, we can come back. 1 John chapter 1 teaches us that. We can confess those sins. He's faithful and just to forgive those sins and cleanse from all unrighteousness. It tells us that we have an advocate with the Father. That if we find ourselves in that situation, we can come back. That God is there waiting for us to return. If you have a need, won't you come? As together we stand and sing the song of invitation.